firms and organizations in developed countries have increased production and reduced costs as they deliver their products and services to customers and clients. It is the cars we drive, the energy we consume, the classes we take. Everything embraces adoption of advances in technology and production processes while integrating cost benefits. This is where we seek discovery of game changing events shaping the economy of our country and the world. Bit early for mail, isn't it? But I, I never get mail. Let's open it. Not just a broomstick, Harry. It's a Nimbus 2000. First, there was the standard broom of the Wizarding World. Then came the Nimbus 2000. They advanced it to the Nimbus 2001, and then the Firebolt. It was a technology and production advancement, much like we see in the Muggle world of business and economics. In developing countries, Often the lack of capital causes firms to hold on to established procedures. It is the 50-year-old iron smelting equipment, the 75-year-old roads and bridges used to deliver products. It is the horse and wagon approach to harvesting timber. This approach changes in developed countries because capital is available as retained earnings or as business loan to purchase and deploy the developed technologies. It is the computerized inventory system for Walmart stores. It is the software-as-a-service internet converter of currencies for on-demand transactions. It is the solar-powered energy backup device to enable your activities. New technologies are introduced pretty regularly, but those technologies need to be adopted by producers. It is only when it is made and adopted by people in the production industry that real technological change is made. Understand each line to represent a worker's productive efficiency. New technology takes time to learn and master. Each person can move up along the line of productivity based on their skills and abilities. I am a forester who started working in the woods of western Washington. When I started my work as a forester, I was taught how important it is to know where on earth we are working. It is part of the legal land system of property in the United States. To make it happen, I started with a map showing roads, streams, and rivers. With a staff compass, I could reconnoiter my position on the planet, and more importantly, verify my position on the map. Very soon, I gained skills with a well-balanced hand compass and a hip chain. Technology advanced well enough to make the use of the hand tools more efficient and it saved me time to complete my tasks. My productivity increased with the introduction of technological changes. Then in May 2000, at the direction of President Bill Clinton, the U.S. government discontinued its use of selective availability to make global positioning systems, GPS, available to commercial users with devices to pinpoint Earth positions in real time. Before this, it was available in real time only to the U.S. government, mostly the military. Then it became the technology to chase. One of the first consumer-grade GPS units was made by the Garmin Company. Just about every forester learned how to navigate with these units. Sometimes they were not reliable because of interference caused by mountains or trees, so the hand compass was still in the vast. Technological advances adopted by Trimble Inc. made higher quality commercial units available and affordable to foresters, and they were deployed in most every firm. Each adoption of new technologies shifted the personal production function upwards, creating a pathway to increase worker productivity. It is super important to recognize that technological change is not the same as invention. An invention is the development of a new product or process for making a product. 
Invention happened when the first GPS satellites were launched by the U.S. government in February 1978. An invention or new information, such as a solution of Earth-to-orbit positional juxtaposition, is not technological change. Technological change resulted from the application of the discovered knowledge to a production process. Technological change happened when selective availability was canceled and live Earth positioning was made available to commercial enterprises. A challenge for everyone who enters an industry, like the forestry example talked about here, is found when people become really good, efficient, and productive using the existing technologies to do their job. The effect is great because that person can get loads of work done using available technologies. The problem happens when that person, or people, do not stay on the cutting edge to track new technologies or to adopt them. It happened in forestry, when well-established people, good at doing their job, did not see advantage to the GPS units introduced in 2000. New entrants to the industry who took some time to learn the new technology outperformed their colleagues on the first week of working together. When you adopt new technologies, you move your personal production function to a higher level, By learning the new technology's use, you slide to the left on a productivity scale for a time, but your upper accomplishments settle to a much higher level of productivity. This is not just about GPS units in forestry. New technologies surround us. Be aware. Read. Talk to others. Make your efforts meaningful. A firm's technology defines how it turns inputs into outputs of goods and services. Technological change is the change in the ability of a firm to produce a given level of output with a given quantity of inputs. This is a challenge for business managers. Find the most appropriate technology for your business. Find and support the right people to use that technology and constantly seek to achieve the production of the products and services people want at a price they will buy it for. I have used a phrase as I trained forestry businesses to use global positioning systems. Find and use the right type of technology for the right people to do the right job. It makes little sense to purchase a $150,000 GPS system requiring three specialists to operate if you are going to set an edge stake for a road building path. A handheld compass and a paper map would serve you just fine. Keep your eyes on the mission intent. One of Walmart's important inputs is its inventory. Walmart invests money to improve management of its inventory by linking the cash registers with inventory control computers. Walmart makes nothing they sell. Improvements in technology help Walmart to be more efficient in turning its inputs, inventory, labor, physical store, into its outputs, sales of products. In economics, we refer to the short run as a period of time during which at least one of a firm's inputs is fixed. It might be a firm with a long-term lease on a factory that is too costly to get out of. It might be the equipment in your restaurant. You need time if you're going to change them. What is left, as a changeable technology, is called your short-run technology. In the long run, no inputs are fixed. The firm can adopt new technology and increase or decrease the size of its physical plant. The operation can completely change everything including the products or services you make. In the long run, you can change everything. This makes a tidy transition to discussion of variable costs and fixed costs. Think in context of making your product. Some costs go up and go down based on how much of the product you make. At a timber mill, the more logs you process, the higher your costs of production. It is the cost of the natural resources used, cost of electricity, employee salaries, saw blades, depreciation of equipment used. That makes a pool of variable costs. Shut the mill down, send employees home, and your variable cost goes to zero. 
Fixed costs are not reliant on the output levels of your operation. This is the cost of the facility used for production, the cost of the vehicles waiting in the yard to be used. It is the licenses and permit fees used to authorize business operations. You pay them whether you operate or not. They are fixed costs. Easy transition to know that total costs, TC, is equal to fixed costs, FC plus variable costs, VC. A traditional academic book publisher turns its inputs like intellectual property, labor, printing machines, paper, factory, and electricity into its outputs printed books. As it increases the number of books it publishes, some of those inputs stay constant and some rise. Hmm, can you identify which ones? Try this with me, one at a time. Intellectual property. Fixed cost in the short run because the book was authored, reviewed, laid out for printing, and made ready for production. Bringing us to the decision point, in the short run, it is fixed. In the longer run perspective, intellectual property is a variable cost because the publisher decides if a certain title will be encumbered or not. Labor is almost always a variable cost at least for the costs of the people handling production. The company administrators are employed producing 10,000 books or 1 million books. They are fixed costs, even in the longer run. Of course, in a true long run, administrators are a variable cost as well. Printing machines are generally always a fixed cost, but do kick into the variable cost in the long run if the firm decides to increase production with new machines, again in the long run. Paper is a great example of a short-run variable cost. Stop printing and you stop using paper. Factory is the other extreme as it is a fixed cost used as a means of operations. Stop printing or move to a new venue and you still have the costs of the factory you already paid for as a sunk cost. Electricity is another variable cost example for the most part. Stop printing and sorting the books and you significantly reduce electricity costs. A little bit of electricity is needed to light the floor, circulate air, and heat or cool the facility. That becomes a fixed cost. Get ready for a flip around on this one. What if the printing company decides to keep producing textbooks, but they decide not to print them anymore? They go totally as PDF books sold to buyers. No books to print. Hmm. Think about this one to consider what costs would remain for the publishing company and how the company would make a profit. As a student, I think you would welcome that book publisher. Recall that economists like to consider all of the opportunity costs of an activity, both the explicit costs and the implicit costs. Explicit costs are found when money is actually spent. It is the wages paid to employees, fuel costs for automobiles, rent, utilities, insurance, and obvious costs. An implicit cost, on the other hand, consider opportunity costs. We consider what other opportunities were available to spend the same money on. Economists measure costs as opportunity costs which is the highest valued alternative that must be given up to engage in an activity. It may be the cost of me working on this video, as opposed to me working to further develop a forced econometrics algorithm for a software as a service platform I maintain. We make trade-offs and the implicit costs express the costs of those trade-offs. Costs may be explicit or implicit. Recall the definition like this. An explicit cost is a cost that involves spending money. An implicit cost is a non-monetary opportunity cost. Explicit costs are sometimes called accounting costs. Economic costs include both accounting costs and implicit costs. Now we put these ideas to the task on an example of Jill quitting her accounting job to open a pizza parlor. She was making $30,000 a year as an accountant, so we can start by putting $30,000 in the ledger as an implicit cost. Group foregone salary with foregone interest she could have made on her savings account 
invested in the new business, and depreciation on the equipment she purchases to use in the parlor. All other costs are explicit costs and are listed in red. These implicit costs are real costs of Jill owning the pizza parlor, even if they don't require an explicit outlay of money. Notice Jill charged herself for the money she took out of her savings, just like the bank charges for her loans. It was not her outlay of an expense, it is the opportunity cost of what her money could have earned if left in an interest-bearing account. Jill's pizza parlor turns labor, technology, ingredients, and utilities into pizzas to sell to customers. We treat ovens as a fixed cost within the first year. No increase or decrease in what she deployed to start with. She can call in more workers or send some home if business is not as planned. They are all variable costs. Jill's technology is how she creates her product. It is more than making a pizza pie. It is the entire experience customers enjoy when they decide to come to her parlor versus someone else's pizza shop, burger joint, or hoagie sandwich grill. It is the quality of the food and the experience at her parlor. A production function is the relationship between the inputs employed by a firm and the maximum output it can produce with those inputs. The production function represents the firm's technology. These are the numbers making her parlor's production function. She needs more workers to make more pizzas, but her oven count does not change in the short run, so it is a fixed cost. Also notice how increasing from one to two employees increased the number of pizza pies made by 250 pizzas. It does not increase by as much when pushing from five to six employees. At that point, with two ovens and a constrained kitchen size, the number of pizzas increased by only 15 pies. I expand the table into these categories, turning counts into costs. We can compare dollars better than item counts. Oven cost is fixed in this example, but the cost of workers is variable and based on the number of pizzas made. We are assuming Jill will be able to sell all the pizzas she makes. Nothing pushed into the trash. I like making tables and filling the cells here, but a graph explains the data to see loads more information in a clear view. This is the total cost curve, starting with the $800 cost for zero pizzas produced. That is the fixed cost of the ovens, even when they are turned off. See the cost rising steeply as four, five, and six employees were hired to make those 600 to 700 pizzas each week. Building on the previous table, divide the total cost of the pizzas by the number of pizzas to get the average total cost of pizzas made. For low levels of production, the average cost falls as the number of pizzas rises. At higher levels, the average cost rises as the number of pizzas rise. Do you see it? Look where average total cost is at its lowest point. It happens at $4.67 per pizza. That happened with two employees making 450 pizza pies a week. We need to see that graphed. See it now? Cost and quantity are obvious. This shape of the total cost curve is indicative of all average total cost curves. Why? Well, let's figure it out with a few more steps. Jill now discovers the realities of specialization. She most likely saw it when she was an accountant. Some employees are skilled at being an accountant, others as human resources some as a salesperson. At the parlor, Jill recognizes how, in shifts, some employees will focus on pizza making while the other busses tables and takes orders. This gives birth to the specialization realized because of the division of labor. One worker may be a people person, performing as a sales-generating order taker. Great combination. Want extra toppings on that? How about some wine? Maybe a Chardonnay? I see specialization brewing here. Synergy is seen when two employees working together 
produce more than twice as much as each working separately. Jill ran the numbers to decide how many workers to hire. To think about this, let's consider the marginal product of labor, the additional output a firm produces as a result of hiring one more worker. Considered in sequence, adding one at a time. The first worker increased output by 200 pizzas. The second increases output by 250. Additional workers add to output, but not by as much. Eventually, they start getting in each other's way. The kitchen was only so large and had only two ovens, a dishwasher, refrigerators, and a cash register to navigate around. This is the law of diminishing returns. At some point, adding more of a variable input to the same amount of a fixed input will cause the marginal product of the variable input to decline. This is what these numbers show as the marginal product of labor decreases as the number of employees increases. We need to see what this looks like when drawn out. The upper graph, total output, shows us how the rate of pizza output begins to slow after about two workers. It is made obvious in the lower graph, marginal product of labor, where it peaks at two employees and falls rapidly as more people are added to the production function. This is a solid illustration of the law of diminishing returns, illustrated using the marginal product of labor. Using the same variables, we start with total output divided by the number of employees. Here it is 550 pizza pies divided by 3 employees, yielding 183.3. A useful way to think about this is that the average product of labor is the average of the marginal products of labor. This seems obvious, but I show you a relationship to consider as you apply this to your own situation. With three employees, Jill's employees made 183.3 pizzas each. With two employees, they had 225 pizza pies each. Based on the average production, she is better off with two employees. This happened because the third worker produced less marginal output than the average of the previous workers. If the next worker produces more marginal output than the average, then the average product will rise instead. We will spin this around to another topic that might be of personal interest to you, a grade point average. Paul's semester GPA starts off poorly, rises, then eventually falls in his senior year. I guess his classes got more difficult. His cumulative GPA follows his semester GPA upward as long as the semester GPA is higher than the cumulative GPA. When his semester GPA dips down below the cumulative GPA, the cumulative GPA starts to head down also. Graphing makes the message clear to show his average semester GPA climbing above his average GPA through his fall semester of his junior year, then dropping below the average during his last three semesters. That brought his average down as well, just like average product and marginal product behaved. Marginal cost is the change in a firm's total cost from producing one more unit of a good or service. Marginal costs are regularly calculated in economics. We like to consider changes at the margin. In this case, we consider the cost of just one more output unit. The delta symbol is very common and used to indicate the change in. Here it is the change in the total cost divided by the change in quantity. That is 2100 minus 1450 equals 650 divided by 450 minus 200 equals 250, equaling $2.60 as the marginal cost of pizzas at Jill's Pizza Parlor. We can visualize the average and marginal costs of production with a graph. The first two workers increase average production and cause cost per unit to fall. The next four workers are less productive, resulting in higher marginal costs of production. Since the average cost of production follows the marginal cost down and then up, this generates a U-shaped average cost curve. Something you always see in these figures 
is how marginal cost will always intersect average cost at ATC's minimum value. Mathematically, it is a truism not always seen in the tables, because for our instance here, we did not increase the quantity of pizzas one at a time. That intersection point will be important to solving your production problem. Stay tuned. Now we explore some axioms of economics. Starting with total cost equals fixed cost plus variable cost. Now we divide them by quantity. We can mathematically do this because we are looking at addition, so we divide each variable by the same value, quantity. We have names for these fractions, the first being average total cost, or ATC, average fixed cost, or AFC, and average variable cost, or AVC. When added together, they equal ATC. In the table we have been using, you can see how these are built and calculated using addition and division. The axioms will always hold true such that when marginal cost is below average total cost, ATC is falling. When MC is above ATC, ATC is rising. It is just like we saw when considering those GPA scores several screens ago. Now we take it home to see it on the graph. Here, all lines are overlaid. Marginal cost shows the axiom displayed minutes ago as it intersects average cost at its lowest value. It happens again when marginal cost intersects average total cost at its minimum value. ATC and AVC will never intersect each other, but they do converge, and AFC will approach a horizontal line as quantity increases to really large values. Recognizing those intersection points are at the minimums of ATC and AVC lines will give you analysis strength. This is an image you will often use in economics. A couple of highlights. First, marginal cost will be shown to initially drop as quantity increases. Generally, it is for a short segment and is due to initial gains realized through the synergy of two people working together accomplishing more than twice as much as each one working separately. It diminishes to show MC climbing at an accelerating rate to intersect AVC and ATC, both at their minimums. These intersections show some significant points for your business's production profile. Those will be discussed more as we talk about scales of competition from perfect competition to monopolistic competition. Remember, in the long run, all business decisions and their costs and revenues are variable. You might add that new production line to your operation, or you might close it all to relocate your operations to another area, region, or country. This makes the distinction of fixed versus variable costs meaningless. You will generally need to put all fixed costs into the presentation of a timeline. You might describe a basket of fixed costs for the next month, six months, or a year, knowing that beyond each of these timelines, they all become variable costs. We have concentrated on a single startup, Jill's Pizza Parlor. Now we expand that to an industry, the U.S. automotive industry. Maybe we consider a smallish startup company like Tesla, founded in 2003, with average total costs initially higher than established competitor Ford. Ford's ATC reflects an established process. People familiar with their technologies and synergistic returns to investment at their facilities. Yep, they can produce their automobiles at a lower ATC than the startup Tesla could in 2003. At low quantities, a Tesla might experience economies of scale. Established firms in the long run have average costs falling as it increases the quantity of output it produces. This is happening with Tesla as we move through 2017 and 18. Here, 
A small car factory can produce at a lower average cost than a large one for small quantities. For more output, a larger factory is generally thought to be more efficient. Well, it is up to a point. The lowest level of output at which all economies of scale are exhausted is known as the minimum efficient scale. At some point, growing larger does not allow more economies of scale. The firm experiences constant returns to scale. Its long run average cost remains unchanged as it increases output. Often, we use this term to apply to an industry as the scope of production is achieved by many firms in different areas. It is advancement of minimum efficient scale. All firms in the industry are seeking adoption of new technologies to apply to their production function. It might be technology already developed that needs to be integrated into specific technological change parameters. If not fully and efficiently integrated, continued increases in size leads to the diseconomy of scale, to the point that making more costs more per unit a situation in which a firm's long-run average costs rise as the firm increases output. This might happen because the firm gets too large to manage effectively. There are many reasons firms in all industries might experience economies of scale. Production might increase at a greater than proportional rate as inputs increase. Having more workers can allow specialization. Large firms may be able to purchase inputs at a lower price. At some point, growth of a facility eclipses additive increases in output. That is the diseconomy of scale we saw on the graph. But what about in the real world? Eventually, managers may have difficulty coordinating huge operations. Consider the quote by the president of Toyota Transplant Factory in Kentucky, USA. This limitation is seen across all operations, social and industrial. I am a Type 1 incident commander for the emergency management operations. In these emergency response situations, commanders, task managers, division leads, and team leaders are capped at seven direct report people each. Effectively, managers are not able to lead more than seven people at a time while keeping attention on accomplishing mission intent. Everyone has one supervisor, and the chain of command is linear. It works for emergency response situations and illustrates how important the recognition of diseconomies of scale really is. On October 1, 1908, the first production Model T Ford was completed at the company's Detroit facility. Between 1908 and 1927, Ford would build some 15 million Model T cars. It was the longest production run of any automobile model in history until the Volkswagen Beetle surpassed it in 1972. Henry Ford is well known for his successes producing cars on an assembly line, allowing division of labor to help achieve economies of scale. Hoping to build on this, Ford built an enormous industrial complex along the River Rogue in Dearborn, Michigan, to produce the Model A. It measured one and a half miles wide by one mile long, including 93 buildings. It employed 100,000 workers. It was the next revision to a great production process. The Model A lost money for Ford because the Rogue River complex was too large to allow efficient production, producing a disconnect between workers and management. Henry Ford was the first to make the mass assembly line and the next to make a diseconomy of scale. What do you think? Do auto manufacturers in this century think about the failures from 100 years ago? Seriously, Tesla has the Gigafactory reflecting their highly automated production lines with intensifying levels of automation, overseen by humans who also work in the production floor. Tesla is changing the paradigm of the automobile industry. We will watch as it happens. They have already distributed production facilities around the USA and through four continents. With 33,000 employees and thousands of automated procedures, this new technology will discover 
a different production possibilities frontier. As I have worked through these problems in this class series, and in my professional life, I have printed a copy of screens like this one to paste on the wall next to my desk, so I can make fast references to it and confirm I have it straight. This is the fact-checking screen where you will be able to verify acronyms, meanings, and formula. Make it happen. As you review materials from this chapter, be cautious to recognize that many folks will confuse the difference between technology and technological change. New technology is good, but it needs to become part of the operations production process to mean anything of value.